we took a latent image recorded on the film of a color test chart and exposed it to 8 MeV X-rays. The lowest radiation dose we applied to the film was 25 rem. The latent image, if it hadn't been subjected to radiation, would look like this. A good quality, high contrast, color transparency. After exposure to the 25 rem radiation, the image is almost entirely obliterated. This means, uh, in my estimation, a dose as little as 5 rem would seriously undermine the transparency. It would look significantly fogged. It would be a very thin image. On his website, Jay Winderley claims that the experiment was invalid because... Dr. Groves exposed his film to x-rays more than a thousand times more energetic than occur in space. He used a linear accelerator to bombard the film with an 8 MeV beam of x-rays. X-ray astronomers say the x-rays from celestial sources radiate at energy levels of less than 5,000 electron volts. There is a tiny element of truth in this statement, but as usual, Windley misdirects his readers. According to the Collins Dictionary of Astronomy, space x-rays typically range from 100 electron volts to 100,000 electron volts. Although lower than Groves' 8 MeV X-rays, 100 keV is a significant difference to what Windley claims. He goes on to tell us that X-rays with energies of only 3 keV can only penetrate 12 centimeters of air. So by Windley's logic, if it takes 12 centimeters to block X-rays packing 3,000 electron volts of energy, 100 keV X-rays can penetrate through 400 centimeters of air. The Apollo command module is 347 centimeters long and 390 centimeters wide. And as Ralph Renee writes in his book, wasn't the command module a mansion in comparison to the LEM's tiny cabin? Add this to the fact that the Apollo film was not transported in protective bags of water. Although solar X-rays have energies as high as 100,000 electron volts, we must also remember that protons and electrons, which strike the moon from the sun and the rest of the universe, can have energies within the levels of 30 MeV to 10 GeV. Solar protons with energies greater than 30 MeV are particularly hazardous. We also know that X-rays are formed by the collision of high-speed electrons. And as Eric Hutschmidt has been able to establish, the Moon is notorious for emitting gamma and X-rays due to these particle collisions. Hutschmidt was able to obtain this photo of the Moon taken by the Rentgen satellite, or ROSAT for short. It was a space-based telescope capable of photographing celestial bodies in the X-ray spectrum. The website this photograph came from had this to say about lunar X-rays. If we could see in X-rays, the moon would look a bit like this. This image was taken when the moon was about half full. Since most of the X-rays are coming from the same part of the Moon illuminated by the Sun, the source of the Moon's X-rays must be related to the Sun. In fact, this is the case. The Moon reflects X-rays from the Sun just as it reflects visible light. You may have noticed that there are a few dots of X-rays in the Moon's dark side. Here, the Moon is not reflecting the Sun's X-rays since it is not in direct light of the Sun. Instead, charged particles, like protons and electrons, in the Sun's solar wind can reach the far side of the Moon, 
and they produce X-rays in much the same way that cosmic rays produce gamma rays on the Moon. As stated previously, the cosmic rays that strike the Moon have energies as high as 10 GeV. On page 197 of his book, John H. Molden writes this about the products of GeV protons. Cosmic photons also come from all directions in the GeV range, but cosmic gamma and X-rays are a small radiation hazard compared to protons and heavier nuclei. The main products of cosmic particle collision with matter at many GeV or higher are pions, gamma photons and nuclear fragments, all of which cause more particles when they collide with more matter, producing photons, pions, neutrinos, muons, protons and neutrons. Radioactive Moon Presented by Science at NASA. The surface of the moon is baldly exposed to cosmic rays and solar flares, and some of that radiation is very hard to stop with shielding. Furthermore, when cosmic rays hit the ground, they produce a dangerous spray of secondary particles right at your feet. All this radiation penetrating human flesh can damage DNA, boosting the risk of cancer. Way out in deep space, radiation comes from all directions. On the moon, you might expect the ground, at least, to provide some relief, with the solid body of the moon blocking radiation from below. But that's not true. When galactic cosmic rays collide with particles in the lunar surface, they trigger little nuclear reactions that release yet more radiation in the form of neutrons. The lunar surface itself is radioactive. So, which is worse for astronauts, cosmic rays from above or neutrons from below? Igor Mitrofanov, a scientist at the Institute for Space Research in the Russian Federal Space Agency in Moscow, offers a grim answer. Both are worse. It should also be noted that it wouldn't have taken a collision with the Moon to create these electromagnetic waves. The X-rays and gamma rays would also have formed from colliding with the spacecraft. As James Van Allen states in his Scientific American article when writing about the results of his early raccoon experiments, Our original observations had detected X-rays only. Now it turned out that the X-rays had been generated by the impacts of electrons on the skin of the instrument package as if it had been the target in an X-ray tube. In our debate, Windley told me this about space X-rays. They're not of a wavelength that penetrates very far. Natural X-rays are of a longer wavelength that diagnostic X-rays produced artificially. Longer wavelengths do not penetrate as far. But with the electrons hitting the CSM from all sides and bursting into X-rays upon collision, they wouldn't have had far to travel. The energy levels of the solar wind and cosmic rays are very well known. The same is true about the photons they produce during particle collision. And yet, Windley would have us believe that David Groh's experiment involving artificially produced X-rays is an inadequate experiment. If he is going to complain about the experiment of David Groves, then what about Russia's experiments? Around the time of Zond 5, the Russians had announced that they had been simulating radiation exposure on Earth by exposing dogs to artificially created radiation. This is wholly ignored by Jay Windley. Windley also states, Dr. Groves used the Bronica ETRSI 120 roll film camera in his tests. He does not explain why he did not use a Hasselblad EL500 or EL700 camera, the type of camera supplied to NASA for use in the Apollo missions. It is still manufactured by Hasselblad and suitable period examples of which can be obtained easily from second-hand dealers. But, 
When I tried to get an identical camera from Hasselblad, I received this response from Lars Bengtsson in Sweden. Thanks for your email regarding one of our Hasselblad space models, the Hasselblad HEDC. This model was produced for the Apollo 11 mission and the first moon landing in 1969. For your information, no camera of this model has been for sale, and as you may be know, 11 pieces of it were left on the moon's surface. So if you happen to pass by, just pick up one of them. This makes one wonder, if the lunar surface is the only place where one can get an identical camera, where did Windley get his? We're going to find out that if we use an identical camera, loaded with identical film, and we shoot pictures of the night sky, we won't get stars.